I'll start with a question that is absolutely out of science that all of us gets asked when we meet a family. And each and every one of us uh, have a way uh, of dealing with family, parents. I have to pass through this because when we talk about the liver, especially for me, it's either a resection or taking the whole liver out and, and putting a new liver. Uh, you have to be passionate. You have to be compassionate. Uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time, I hug the father just to uh, ease the situation and uh, almost always it's a big shock. Uh, if we focus on al- al- malignancy or al- tumors, every family will ask you, of course, is doctor or not? Is this a malignant tumor? And the word khabith, my way is, is disseminate this uh, word. Uh, why I always tell them khabith, the kibar, the atfal, we call it waram. Uh, and and uh, the treatment of the waram in the kibar is not the small. And the small are not, I mean, they have the ability to control, they have the ability to control. So always I give hope to, to the family and I think every one of you uh, needs I need to do that. If you start uh, suppressing or depressing the family, you actually lose part of the team. A very important part of your team. The father and mother are part of your team. If you lose them, uh, you're going to suffer. Uh, it's very important to have the communication. You uh, can يعني, very strong, very powerful connection uh, with the father and mother. When did it all start? Doctor? <laughs> they always feel this guilt. Uh, And, and my answer to them is we will never know, we'll never be able to know it's not your fault. Uh, and I've seen uh, many cases uh, similar to this uh, and actually your case uh, I've seen the both spectrum worst uh, of the worst. family. You don't want to lose the father and mother. Uh, Dr. Mankour, I'm very sorry for interruption because uh, we have like uh, a plenty of international uh, uh, participants. So if we can just uh, do it in English. Well, um, that's why I have it in English on the screen, but I will stick to English even when I speak. Thank sure. you very much. Sure Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Is it curable? Uh, every tumor is treatable. Uh, so I, I tried with the family to, to use the word treatable every t- tumor is treatable curable is something that we we do together as a as a team and uh, every tumor when you deep inside you uh, when it's a malignancy uh, every malignancy has its own ways to come back uh, the word curable uh, might hit you so use the word treatable is my kid going to die so the answer is right away no with with god's help and your help stay positive stay optimistic You don't want to uh, overshoot talking about mortalities. Uh, you want to try to keep your numbers as low as possible. There are situations where, especially when you talk about OR, the, the death ward, and uh, you know, uh, anesthesia alone, out, out of uh, 10,000, uh, one might die just from anesthesia. So uh, I always do uh, use the, the example of if you pass the street, you might die just passing the street. So I might die even as a, as a surgeon before I do the surgery for your kid. Uh, always try to give hope to the family. Is my kid going to go uh, to get chemo and radio? I, I try to avoid answering those questions because Uh, it's a tumor board uh, answer. It's not even the oncologist. And uh, if you start saying yes or no, you're going to put yourself in a trap where the next question will be what are, because everybody gets worried from the chemo and radio and its, it's uh, problems and, and kidney toxicity and, and uh, heart toxicity and lung toxicity. And, and it's a long uh, question that uh, you You don't want to answer on that situation. How toxic is chemo is another question that you answer with. I'll ask my colleagues. Well, they will come and explain it to you. Are you sure of what you're doing is another uh, uh, question that shows frustration. You don't want to be asked this question. Uh, this means that there was a, uh, an issue trying to uh, get connected with the family. So treatment plan, the answer is we do this as a team. And the treatment plan is, is discussed amongst great brains and, and a big team. And we do it through the tumor board, cellic approach is part of the holistic plan so that that always eases the, the situation in the family that they're taking care of a big team um the those questions are uh, questions that i i tend to avoid because but it comes in the mcqs and they're tricky because i can give you this question the most common malignant liver tumor in pediatric age group uh, so 
is malignant. So in the words there, you have to be careful that not the most common liver tumor in pediatric age group. My apologies. Um, so the most common malignant liver tumor in pediatric age group malignant is hepatoblastoma. Is this true? No, of course. It's not true. Everybody think that it's hepatoblastoma. It's actually same as everybody. Secondary malignant tumors are the most common. If you talk about primary, if you add the word primary, you say it's the most common primary malignant liver tumor in pediatric age group, you would put hepatoblastoma. If you start putting age there, if you say the most common primary malignant liver tumor in kids more than six years of old, the answer will be totally different. Um, so you, those are tricky questions, and uh, you, you really have to come out from this presentation knowing exactly how to answer those questions. So the answer for this question with this phrase is secondary malignant tumors. If I put the most common primary malignant liver tumor, it's hepatoblastoma in young age group. In the first two years of life, the most common primary, see the word here, and I didn't put malignant. I said primary tumor. Is is it mesenchymal hematoma? Is it hepatoblastoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, or is it hemolytoma? And obviously the answer here is hemangioma. In fact, every liver donor that we use their livers to, to be able to transplant it to their parents and kids, almost, I would say 70, 60% of the cases that present, they have a small little hemangioma here and there. That's a very common uh, tumor that uh, uh, most, of, most of people have. So infantile hemangioma is the answer here. If we say in the first two years of life, the most common primary malignant, we know the answer. Uh, it's hepatoblastoma. So, uh, there is a competition between infantile hemangioma and hepatoblastoma. As you see in this graph, uh, the percentage goes for hepatoblastoma. So if you get asked, uh, is it uh, hepatoblastoma or hemangioma? The answer will be hepatoblastoma, despite that hemangioma is so common. Uh, because we're talking about the, the cases that present to you. There are a lot of cases that we miss, a lot of cases that we miss. But the cases that gets presented and the answer that you should have if uh, there is uh, such question, which is an unfair question, but people continue to bring those questions, is it hepatoblastoma or, hem or hemangioma? Um, and it's really tricky, and I hope you would never have such questions. So hemangioma is really a journey. This, this is a picture that uh, is in the north part of, of uh, California, uh, great forest, great walk, and hopefully you, you'll have such a walk. It's not a rosy walk like this, but it's, it's a journey that you have to go yourself and the family when we talk about hepatic hemangioma. So hopefully uh, when you reach the end of the journey, you understand all the aspects that you need to, you need to know about hemangioma and hemangioendothelioma. So again, it's the most common benign solid. And I'm putting the word solid here. Some people would say, really? It's usually cystic, but that's it. It's the most common benign solid hepatic tumor in childhood, accounting for about 16% of all pediatric liver tumors. So the word solid and cystic here is another trick that you might get yourself in. Uh, so always omit it. It's the most common benign hepatic tumor in childhood. And it accounts for 16% of all pediatric liver tumors. They tend to have a rapid proliferation phase in the first six to 10 months, and then it will regress even without treatment. And this slow involution and regression can take up to 10 years. Your role here is to observe until it's resolved with imaging. Now, the associated congenital anomalies, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a picture here on the right side of many types of hemangiomas. Some of them are very scary, some of them are small and, and tiny, and, and, and we'll talk about that. The, those are the uh, associated anomalies, uh, osler weber Flipper, uh, turnaway weber uh, heller down syndrome, Bickwith vitamin, the primaric hernias, trisomy 21, transposition of the, uh, the great arteries, and so on. The, the presentation usually there are asymptomatically, okay, they're fine. Somebody does a, 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 an ultrasound, somewhere and they find, oh, we have a hemangioma. Sometimes they present as with hepatomegaly. A uh, high output congestive heart failure is, is an issue. And that, of course, is associated with, with respiratory distress uh, or respiratory distress alone. A hypothyroidism, so you got to check the PSH and the thyroid function, uh, and we'll talk why they have hypothyroidism. Uh, anemia. Rarely, uh, they present with uh, Kazabak um, Merit syndrome, where uh, the platelets are low, the hemoglobin is low, and uh, they uh, have consumption coagulopathy. So on the right side, you see uh, hemangiomas here and there. Whenever you see a child who presents with multiple cutaneous hemangiomas, more than five, more than five, you should also screen them for infantile hepatic hemangiomas, and also you should 
uh, screen them for other sites, including the lungs, the pancreas, the lymph nodes, and the bone. Um, so this can be found in up to 20%, 25% uh, of the population. So it's, it's uh, common to, to, to see those uh, cutaneous uh, hemangiomas. Again, if they are more than five, we have to screen the rest uh, of the other systems, pancreas, lymph node, and bone. Sorry, this is crowded, but it says enough. Um, this is the classification that uh, you need to know about hemangioma. So focal is, is, is the most common, usually solitary lesion. Very typical presentation in the MRI. You see a hypo intense on T1 and then hyper intense on T2 images. If you do the gadolinium scan, a rapid filling happens, uh, especially at the peripheries. If the hemangioma is big, and then there is a variable central uh, enhancement. The, the radiologist is almost always confident enough, and I, or sometimes I say very confident, to tell you that this is a hemangioma. Uh, so it is a, an imaging diagnosis. You don't need to do biopsy, and I hope no one does biopsies for hemangiomas. And associated complications, as we said, the Casabac Merritt syndrome, which occurs in, if the hemangioma is more than five centimeters. So remember the word, the, the number five, more than five cutaneous hemangiomas. And if it's more than five centimeter, then you get the complications. The clinical course uh, tend to be asymptomatic, as we said, and the outcomes are excellent because they tend to have an involution and regression until they're nothing. Um, now, multifocal and diffuse, there is a lot of similarities here. I think they're rare because I, I tend not to see them and I'm, I'm glad I don't see them, but they are catastrophe. Uh, sometimes malignancies are easier to take a decision about than benign. So you say this is a benign, but it's, it's, it is a, a benign catastrophe to the family, especially if you have a diffuse uh, type of uh, infantile hemangiomas where there is no liver. The liver is replaced with with hemangiomas all over the place. So if we go to the diffuse, there is no liver and they they, they actually have high liver functions and, and the liver is marked, markedly enlarged, it's compressing like if like uh, the picture that you see on the left side, compressing in the diaphragm, compressing the heart, the, the lungs, they uh, get massive uh, hepatomegaly, hypothyroidism, abdominal compartment syndrome is, is a problem that you need to act upon. And the issue is, okay, we release the abdomen and then what? What you do? Uh, especially if, if, if he's a neonate um, and a respiratory compromise. Um, so you release the, the tension from the abdomen with a mesh, if we say, and you uh, send, you continue watching them hoping that the hemangioma will regress, but sorry, they have high mortality when they get abdominal compartment syndrome. So it's a desperate maneuver. If you do it, you'll end by still high mortality. It all starts after birth, after birth, and, and the, the growth uh, continues sometimes after birth um, uh, for a, uh, one year. And then if uh, they uh, make it through involution for uh, five to seven years. Multifocal is, is uh, very similar, um, but uh, probably less uh, intense. So remember, focal, uh, it's not bad. Remember the five and five and multifocal and diffuse. Remember that you can't do much uh, for those cases. Uh, the solitary uh, hemangiomas, uh, mostly asymptomatic. They regress over time uh, with no intervention. As we said, you can have high flow shunts uh, within or between uh, the, the heart and, uh, sorry, between the lungs and the liver. Associated low-grade anemia, as we said, and thrombocytopenia. Um, we discussed the multifocal, the diffuse type. We talked about frequently associated with high output uh, cardiac failure. We discussed that the asymptomatic patients should undergo imaging to, to the brain, to the chest, to the bone. Check the TSH and T3, T4 levels because they get hypothyroidism and look for associated congenital, congenital anomalies. Why do they get high, severe hypothyroidism? Uh, due to increased degradation of thyroid hormone by type 3 iodothyronine, uh, the iodinase that is upregulated in those benign tumors. That leads to how, uh, on its own, they, that leads uh, to uh, low output uh, cardiac failure or significant mental retardation. And correction, sometimes correction uh, of the situation can require very large doses of, of thyroid hormone replacement. That actually helps and resolves, ends with involution of, of the hemangioma. The diffuse type, again, you don't want to see those cases, but if you're stuck in that situation, um, it's near uh, near total replacement of the hepatic parenchyma. As we said, abdominal compartment syndrome is, is a catastrophe. Um, high output cardiac failure is another issue and significant respiratory uh, compromise. The workup includes liver functions, as we said, the coagulation profile, because they can get consumption, uh, coagulopathy, um, the thyroid functions, TSH, T3, T4, you would expect 
expect TSH to be high and, and the T3 low. Alpha fetoprotein level, I'm putting the table here because you really have to be careful. Uh, there is a, a variation by age. So do it, uh, but be careful of the number that you, you see. Uh, imaging studies, of course, ultrasound, CT, MR, and echo are, are needed in those cases. Uh, of course, the, uh, if it is multifocal uh, or diffuse, uh, or if it is more than five centimeter uh, solitary, you need to do the bone scan check for, for uh, uh, hemangiomas there. Biopsy, please, please don't. Uh, it, it's, it is uh, a, a diagnosis that can be made by imaging, uh, and uh, the, the ultrasound, CT, MR complement each other to make the radiologist confident enough uh, to say, yes, it is a hemangioma. So if we talk about the imaging on CT, uh, of course, with, with an IV contrast, the hemangioma will either enhance diffusely or show a rim enhancement that is followed by gradual filling of the center of the region. It's a very typical uh, uh, picture that uh, uh, radiologists are becoming very good at it because they keep seeing those uh, cases in, in many uh, CT scans. Less than one centimeter enhanced uh, homogeneously, more than two centimeter demonstrate peripheral rim uh, enhancement, and in between, uh, they show mixed enhancement patterns. The bottom line is there is a specific enhancement pattern on the CT scan that would characterize uh, uh, hemangiomas to the, to the limit, to the level that the radiologist wouldn't even ask for MR or any other uh, uh, study. The challenges uh, when we talk about uh, imaging is sometimes, and that's why the word, was, the word that we saw there is solid, uh, sometimes it can mix and intermix with uh, follicular nodular hyperplasia, which we will talk about later, uh, and hepatic mesenchymal hematoma, and even um, uh, uh, biliary uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, because there is a tendency to look like uh, uh, cystic, uh, uh, a mix of cystic and solid, which can uh, be similar in the imaging uh, to, to hemangioma. That's where uh, a biopsy might, uh, so if the, if the, if the, the radiologist is not confident enough, uh, then you might do the biopsy. But there are other studies that we will talk about later on that will help you to define uh, uh, FNH, uh, for instance, and uh, adenoma, uh, although adenoma is not here. So try again, try not to biopsy because it's, it's, a, it's a hemangioma, it might bleed. These associations uh, are important to remember during the radiological evaluation of a child uh, with multiple uh, hepatic masses. I mean, having other uh, differentials and uh, the treatment, believe it or not, uh, when, when it started, when it all started, uh, the propranolol was something amazing. Uh, and it just didn't make sense to me how propranolol can do that. Uh, but sure enough, the, the literature is full <laughs> of evidence that <clears throat> support using propranolol. Uh, and it's actually, if we, if we say propranolol and steroids, they're actually the medical, uh, the way to go. Uh, 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 I, I honestly wouldn't uh, encourage steroids for anything if we can use something else other than steroids. Uh, and probably that's why propranolol is becoming very favorable. So it gives 80% response rate over a long time, of course. Uh, it's, uh, its proposed mechanism of action include vasoconstriction, inhibition of the angiogenesis, uh, and induction of apoptosis. The, the dose, uh, I think you should remember it because um, most of the time you're, you're the one who uh, see those patients and you're the one who uh, might be uh, following and treating those patients. I think uh, one people use one, per, uh, uh, one milligram per kilogram per day divided in three doses but you have to start slow uh, because of the side effects of the propranolol, uh, the beta blockers that we all know. Uh, so uh, start slow, uh, increase the dose slowly, uh, try to go uh, higher uh, with time uh, and uh, uh, over uh, uh, months, uh, several months, you will see the regression. So several months ending, use up to one year and be aware uh, of the side effects. Uh, <laughs> I had to uh, uh, be open to any uh, uh, other ideas, uh, and I was uh, interested to see that uh, curcumin has, has uh, an anti-angiogenetic effect. Actually, they, we all have it, or most of us, or some of us have it in, in uh, food, 
and um, in our food and and uh, I didn't know that it has this anti angiogenic anti tumor uh, any tumor uh, anti tumor uh, activity and has been tested with some success uh, in a variety uh, of tumors now you know we all know that that uh, hemangiomas regress and go they go into involution uh, phase is it really the 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 uh, uh, curcumin that helps uh, I'm not sure, but there are studies, and I put a study down here uh, for you. Uh, so you'll get this. You'll be asked by families, and you, you, it, it's nice to know that. Uh, sure, go ahead. It's herbal treatment, and um, if your baby, uh, if you're convinced that it helps, go ahead. The risk factors associated with the mortality. The mortality decreases. Uh, it used to be 17 to 90 percent. Uh, now it's down to 9 percent in the uh, multifocal hemangiomas, and still around 40 percent in the uh, Fuse uh, type. That's in one study that I put for you uh, down here. Uh, for this include jaundice and multiple tumor nodules. Highest risk factor was the presence of uh, congestive heart failure. So heart failure is bad news when it comes to um, a diffuse type uh, hemangioma. The, the children at the greatest risk for death are those with diffuse infantile hemangiomas in whom there is near total replacement of liver parenchyma. The recommendation of a very famous center, again, the families might ask you, uh, I want to take my kid to Boston Children, and this is what they do. Um, uh, it's not far uh, from what we're doing, and I keep say, telling the families, it's your choice, you can go. Uh, sorry, I keep telling the uh, families, it's your choice, you can go, but we can do this here, and actually we can counsel with them. The asymptomatic lesions uh, should be monitored with ultrasound until they resolve. Uh, the symptomatic lesions, so you see the word here, asymptomatic and symptomatic. Now, the symptomatic lesions should be treated with steroids, so uh, the issue with, with, with the symptoms, we will all face it. Mike, so if the kid cries, they always, it's like the umbilical hernia. The, um, the hemangioma of the liver is the umbilical hernia of a baby. Uh, my baby is crying because of the umbilical hernia. So you bring the family, you tell them, no, it's, it's fine. It's an umbilical hernia. He's crying because he's crying. But the, war, the, the symptomatology, when we talk about hemangioma, is an issue. And that's why most of kids would end by being on steroids or proper. Uh, because of the symptomatology. Uh, if there is no response, the hemangioma should be embolized after using steroids. That's their recommendation in Boston children. I think they, they like the steroids. Infants with, with diffuse disease should have TSH uh, checked and uh, be started on steroids. If abdominal compartment syndrome is present, the infant need to be evaluated for a liver transplant in case there is no response to steroids. So that's what they do. Have I ever transplanted a kid who has uh, diffuse um, uh, type uh, uh, hemangioma. I, I have never done that. So this means that probably we didn't get those cases because they they uh, they die uh, uh, before they come to us. And I think this is the uh, same situation in, in King uh, uh, Faisal Specialist Hospital. The, the, the other issue with it is you're already having congestive heart failure. You have the thyroid affecting uh, the the, the hypothyroidism affecting the baby, uh, and it's not something simple where you take the liver and you just put a, a new liver in in a uh, in a small baby. But it's it's been mentioned, and this is the way to go. Malignant transformation, uh, another uh, another trap. Can can this transform into malignancy? And uh, the people now are smart enough. They go into uh, the uh, Mr. Google and they Google it and they find that, oh my God, there are uh, cases where uh, a hemangioma turned into angiosarcoma. It's so rare. And for this reason, patients who are asymptomatic or who become asymptomatic after therapy uh, must be monitored for complete anatomic resolution of their hemangiomas. Now, with the laparoscopic uh, resections, uh, you, you might want to consider uh, resecting residual disease. Um, the issue is, uh, by the time, uh, because it, it, will, it takes a long time, by the time they reach years of age, they might become uh, adolescent and they go to the, uh, to the uh, adult surgeons and uh, uh, family and the, and, and the patient himself uh, tend to forget about this. Um, but this is, this is the recommendation. Uh, uh, so because of the angiosarcoma, which is rare, uh, this little uh, lesion, uh, you should consider resecting it or follow it at least. Um, for some time. And it's it's a trap. This is a trap. I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. 
but those are the recommendations. <clears throat> uh, we'll jump to take a deep breath in. Mangioma is very important. If we, I want to summarize for you, uh, it's a very common benign tumor and the solitary uh, type, and remember the number five, if it's uh, uh, more than five uh, cutaneous lesions, you need to do further investigations. The imaging, if it is, uh, and the imaging would include uh, looking for more hemangiomas um, in lungs and lymph nodes and other sites and bone. Uh, if it's it is more than five centimeter. Those are the lesions that um, uh, causes uh, complications that you, be, you need to be aware of. Those patients are your uh, friends. Um, you will continue to observe them, whether you, uh, of course, observe them with imaging, whether you put them on propranolol, you put them on steroids, uh, or even uh, if you do embolization. So uh, hopefully that summarizes and wraps up the hemangiomas. And now we'll jump to uh, mesenchymal uh, hematomas. Uh, um, uh, so again, the MCQs, uh, the third most common hepatic tumor uh, is mesenchymal hematoma after hemangiomas and after hepatoblastomas. Uh, it is the second most common benign tumor in children, uh, of course, after hemangioma. You see, I'm trying to give you all the tricks when we talk about MCQs. 80% uh, are diagnosed within the first two years of life, and there is poor prognosis that happens uh, when they are diagnosed in antenatally with a 30% uh, mortality. Of course, uh, uh, like uh, every uh, uh, antenatal disease that causes mortality, it's the high drops, the congestive heart failure uh, are the main reasons for fatality. After birth, uh, the presentation uh, is a big mass uh, by exam uh, and imaging. This is uh, a baby, uh, and you can see the, the mass, uh, 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 which is, uh, goes very well with the imaging. Of course, uh, uh, the resection uh, is the way to go. We'll talk more, uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, so on, on CT and ultrasound, uh, it is a multi-septated, uh, multi-cystic, uh, anechoic mass. When we talk about ultrasound, um, it is uh, most of the time on the right side. And actually, most tumors are, are on the right side because it's the bigger side. Uh, uh, they're large, well-circumscribed uh, tumors that measure at least 8 to 10 uh, centimeter in diameter. That's big when you talk about uh, a liver that is only 10 centimeter in size. So you can observe, uh, you can aspirate, um, but please prefer for resection. It's the best way. Transplantation is very rare uh, to happen for, for uh, uh, this indication, uh, but please, 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 I'm saying it three times. Do not marsipilize those uh, tumors. They're really bad. And I am astonished and, and shocked that uh, very respectful textbooks are still putting marsipilization there. I have a case uh, where it's been referred to us. And when I, refer, uh, when I looked at the literature, it's scary. If you marsipilize those patients will continue to have ascites and will continue to have, you see those cysts here, the whole abdomen turn into very similar cysts. And the cysts are attached to the IVC, to the renal vein, to the mesentery, to the bowel. It's almost impossible to resect it if you do marsipialization. It's a big trap for a liver surgeon to take a case thinking that he can do good for those patients. So do no harm at the beginning is the way to go. If you want to remember something in, in mesenchymal and hematoma is... It's one thing. Please do not use laparoscopic because, you know, it looks really favorable in, mar in, in laparoscopy. It's only assessed, let's just marsipilize it, open it to abdominal cavity. You will end with having ascites, a drainage, and after a drainage, after a drainage, and it's an endless story. Uh, so this is very important to remember in mesenchymal hamartoma. Inoculation for small lesion is being described. Marsipilization, as we said, uh, please don't do it. Complete excision of the lesion with a margin of normal liver is curative. Uh, and those cases, needs to be resected. There is no question in my mind that uh, we need to observe for some time. Um, and if it is too big, liver transplantation is needed in cases of bilateral, multiple, or unresectable disease due to the potential for coexistent, undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma that I will describe it to you. Uh, we'll talk about it, uh, I think, at the end. So again, another uh, tumor that might transform and become malignant or actually harbor malignancy as we're speaking. So 
I've never said for mesenchymal or hematoma, I'm going to observe. It's, it's in the books. But every patient that comes to me because of this, I say, we need to resect this tumor. Okay, so we're done with mesenchymal hematoma. The take-home message is uh, it can Im uh, uh, imitate uh, hemangioma. It's, it's a mix of solid and cystic. The uh, most important is to make the diagnosis. You want to do the biopsy, do the biopsy. And please do not mercipulize. The way to go is resection. Um, if we talk about FNH and uh, adenoma, the one at the, 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 the picture at the bottom, which have tanny, yellowish, fatty adenoma, is uh, I said the word adenoma, it's an adenoma. And the one at the top is actually how a follicular nodular hyperplasia look like. It's a great picture to show. And you would uh, say, come on, how would imaging, can, you know, how, how can, can't we differentiate this in imaging? It's a fact. Um, there, is, there is similarities in imaging. And they sometimes, uh, actually most of the time, you will end by doing a biopsy to be able to uh, differentiate. But hey, even if you do the biopsy, there is also difficulty. And we'll talk about it uh, later on. Uh, so if we talk, if we take the FNH, the one thing that is famous about FNH is the central scar. So single feeding artery, and there is an absence of bile ducts or vein in the lesion. So the CT scan with a contrast and an MR, whether it's uvas, use the T1 um, uh, shows an early enhancing lesion in the right lobe uh, in this picture with a hypodense central scar. Remember the central scar, the arrow here and there. This is how it looks. It's typical. It's typical on imaging. And there is something, uh, another study, uh, because they, uh, those tumors are cup for cells. So there is a, a nuclear scan that you can do that will help you to sleep at night and say, okay, it is uh, an FNH. Uh, how to differentiate FNH from others, uh, as I told you, nuclear scan, uh, technetium, sulfur colloid scanning. Uh, FNH lesions take up uh, the tracer because Kupfer cells in FNH um, FNH is famous for having the cup cells, and, and uh, the, the technetium uh, sulfur colloid will be taken uh, by the cup cells and it will light up. Hepatic adenomas are sheets of hepatocytes. They do not take this tracer and this is how you differentiate between FNH and adenoma. Why do, you, why do we have to differentiate? Because one, uh, the adenoma can turn into uh, hepatocellular carcinoma more than uh, FNH. You can argue for uh, observing FNH, but again, uh, the the biopsy, as you uh, as you see down, and the biopsy has a diagnostic accuracy only fifty percent. So you rely on imaging, and if you do the bi do the biopsy, but it it might not help you, uh, and most of the time the liver surgeon would end by a resection. If it's feasible, I would encourage a resection. Um, the MRI has 80% ability to show the central scar. So everybody's talking about the central scar. Um, uh, so the maximum, it's amazing. The, the MR is more accurate in diagnosing uh, those uh, tumors, more accurate than the biopsy. So you need to know those facts about FNH if you get uh, an FNH. Uh, the management when the patient is asymptomatic, symptomatic and are asymptomatic. So again, we go into this dilemma, you know, the, once there is something in the liver, every focus will go into the liver and the asymptomatic becomes symptomatic. So most of the patient will say, yes, I have symptoms. Uh, if it is more than five centimeter, if there is progression, uh, 0.5 a centimeter per year. So you see here that uh, there is an observation period uh, until you do the resection. But believe me, by the end, you resect most of those tumors, either you or the adult liver surgeon. And the fourth indication for intervention or resection is if the diagnosis is not clear. You're not sure. You're not sure. Um, and, and of course, you cannot be sure uh, 100%, let's say 95% uh, or even 90%. The best is 80% uh, confidence with the MR. So biopsy doesn't help, the imaging doesn't help, patient is symptomatic, it's more than five centimeter, uh, and you're not sure, you're worried, the family is worried, you end by resecting this tumor. Uh, arterial embolization, sure. Uh, do it, but the tumor is still there. The malignancy and the, the sorry, the, uh, the, the FNH can turn into malignancy uh, if it's not resected. The, the arterial embolization wouldn't kill uh, all cells. So my advice, don't sleep forever. I mean, I'm not saying at, sleep at night, 
but sleep forever on a liver mass. Uh, either you continue to follow them um, uh, with uh, surveillance uh, uh, of um, uh, either whatever you're comfortable with, CT scan, MR, or whatever the radiologist wants, CT scan, MR, ultrasound, um, uh, one, uh, two modalities together uh, every six months is the way to go. Uh, hepatocellular adenoma is a, they, they can turn malignant. They can rupture. This is what you need to remember about hepatocellular adenoma. And that's why you have to 